It is only through logos that I understand God wants me to prosper. Hallelujah. If I don't read the Bible, I would never know. God never visited me and said, yeah, I want you to prosper. But if I read the Bible, I understand God wants every one of his children to prosper. Can I hear an amen? I want to talk to you tonight about faith for prosperity. Okay, faith for prosperity. You have to realize faith is not a cuss word as some would depict it to be so. Some people are so averse even to mention the word prosperity because they think this is not of God, this is of the devil. The, and some people have, I can understand some because some people who have been teaching have taught it in a way that it has been abused. The pendulum has swung too far on one side that it has given a bad taste in some people's mouths. But we can't throw it away just because of the abuse. We have to see if it is really in the Word of God. What does God say about it? And how do I tap into it? Because everything is by faith. Your salvation is by faith. Grace provides, but it's only by faith you possess it. Now, before I can possess it, I should know what grace has provided. Can I hear an amen? So what is the will of God? Let's look at John, 3 John chapter, oh, sorry, there's only one chapter, verse 2, 3 John 2. Beloved, above all, above all, I wish that thou mayest prosper and be in health even as your soul prospereth. Beloved, above all, I wish that thou mayest prosper. How can you say that prosperity is not of God. The Bible is so clear. It says God desires for us to prosper. Can I hear an amen? Talk to me. Talk to me. All right. I wish that thou must prosper even as your soul prospers. God's will is for his people to prosper. Not to live in lack. Not to live in insufficiency but to be in a place where they can be a blessing. When he called Abraham, he said, Abraham, I will bless you to be a blessing to the nations. Say amen. amen. Are you the seed of Abraham? My question. If you are, say amen. amen. Say yes. yes. Loudly speak back. Are you the seed of Abraham? Right up in the balcony. Are you the seed of Abraham? Yes. Say amen. All right, say yes. If you are the seed of Abraham, the mandate that was given to Abraham is also my mandate. But the question is, how can I give what I don't have? If I'm not prosperous, how can I be a blessing? If I'm always looking to people, to government, to organizations, to some of the nations somewhere else, I'm not blessed. I'm looking for the blessing. How can I be a blessing? And listen, He's not talking about just you living the blessed life. God wants to use you as a channel to distribute His blessing, not just to your neighborhood, but to the nations. Somebody say Amen. amen. That means you should not think first, I'm an Indian. You are a, you are a child of God. You belong to God's kingdom. Your economy is not dependent on the economy of this nation. You're dependent on the economy of the kingdom. There is no lack in the kingdom. Say amen. There is no ups and downs in the economy of the kingdom of God. Are you all in agreement? Yes. Come on. There, there is no loss in the kingdom of God. There is always increase. There's always abundance. There's always more than enough. God is a God of more than enough. Hallelujah. I said, hallelujah. hallelujah. Jesus. God wants us to enjoy the abundance. He created the world, the earth, for us to enjoy. The good things in the earth that we see the world enjoying were not really created for them. They were created for His people. He did not create all the luxuries and all the blessings so that the crooks can enjoy it. 
But we are ignorant and that's why we are loving those that do not know God and are crooks to let them enjoy the blessing. You know, the Bible says, my people are destroyed for what? Not because the enemy is too big. Not because the enemy is too powerful. But because of the lack of knowledge. Lack of revelation. Lack of understanding. This is what we require. We need to know who we are and what God has provided for us in the context of prosperity. So he says, Beloved, above all, I wish that thou mayest prosper and be in health even as your soul prospered. I wish that they must prosper and be in health. Be in health. That means God wants every one of us to enjoy divine health. We all love miracles, don't we? We all love miracles? Yes. But that's not God's best for us. God's best for us is not to be healed from one sickness and from another sickness and another sickness. No, God's best for us is to live in divine health. Hallelujah. He wants us to enjoy divine health in, in such a manner that whatever my father suffered from, I will not suffer. See, we've been brainwashed and taught in certain terms and in certain ways in school and in college. Now, we don't deny the facts, but we have to understand truth is more powerful than fact. Come on. The fact is, there are certain sicknesses that people say, or doctors say, or science says are hereditary. Is that true? Your father, so that's why when you go to the doctor, they ask you a history. Did your father have high blood pressure? Did your mother have blood, high blood sugar? Did they have heart attack? Did they have this? Did they have, they're trying to see what your history was to trace it and to say, okay, based on that, uh, we are not surprised you have this problem. So we've been so trained to think in those lines that now we think, oh my God, my dad had arthritis. And so now about 55, 60, and I have a sharp pain in my knees. What's the first thought? Arthritis. Am I clear? Are you following what I'm saying? See, when you entertain that thought, you're opening the door and saying, Mr. Arthritis, please come into my body. You're welcoming him. Whereas you have to, and I have to realize, it might, see, he, the postman can come, the, deliver, the delivery man can come, but you don't have to receive it. If FedEx showed up at your door, knocked on the door with a box of rattlesnakes, would you receive it? No. So get lost, take it, that's your gift, not mine. So when the devil shows up with the gift called arthritis, you may receive it or you may reject it. You will not reject it if you don't know who you are and what God has provided for you. Yes, my dad might have had it. My aunt may have had it, but I will not have it. It's done. It's over because I'm a new creation. In me does not flow the blood called, blood type called A, B, O. No, the blood type called G, which is God's blood. So I refuse to let let that come in through entertaining it through my mind. I said, I reject it in the name of Jesus. I do not want it. The pain may come. I curse that pain and say, take, pack up your bags and leave in the name of Jesus. It may persist, but I refuse to give him, give him cognizance or give him permission or, 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 you know, or accept it or, you know, and say, oh my God, I have this. No, I do not have it. Now, let me say this. Let me make it clear. I am not denying the fact, okay? I am saying the truth is more powerful than the fact. The truth is I was already healed. I've been set free. I'm a new creation. Now the very life of God is flowing through me. So that means, according to Romans chapter 8 verse 11, the very Spirit of God that raised Jesus from the dead is now flowing through my mortal body, making it alive. Come on. So the body may be susceptible to these attacks, but I'm saying, hey, even though it comes, I am not going to accept it. I am going to declare the very Spirit of God that raised Him from the dead is now working in the members of my body, resurrecting me, hallelujah, empowering me to take 
to take authority and crush it under my feet so that I can live in divine health. Somebody say amen. amen. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. hallelujah. You see, you have to understand, it is God's will for you to prosper with divine health. Prosper in every area of your life. Prosperity is not limited only to finances. When, whenever the word prosperity is mentioned and you think only money or wealth, you're myopic in your thinking. Prosperity covers all areas and gamuts of life. Every area. What good is all the money and the wealth in the world for somebody that has been diagnosed with cancer and the doctor says, you don't have too much time left. Is that prosperity? Talk to me. Is that prosperity? If somebody has toiled all his life and amassed a lot of wealth and he now has a great mansion, the most expensive cars and a couple of jets sitting in the air airport that belong to him. But he comes home that night, every night to an empty home. No wife because he didn't give her, give her time. She left with someone else. The children don't recognize him as father. They've left the house. They don't even call him once in six months. Is that prosperity? No. So please understand, don't be upset when the word prosperity is mentioned because God wants you to prosper in all areas of life. In your, first and foremost, in your relationship with God. That's why I said, as your soul prospereth. How can the soul prosper if you lack knowledge? As you receive knowledge, your mind is illuminated. The part of, the, part of your soul, right? Illumination comes. Revelation comes. Light comes. Now, based on that, I am beginning to understand the heart of God. That's why reading the logos is so important. I get to know the intents of God. I get to know the purposes of God. I get to know why God wants me to prosper. I get to know the vision for my life. I get to know my destiny. I understand so much more about the person of God. Hallelujah. It is only through logos now I understand God wants me to prosper. Hallelujah. If I don't read the Bible, I would never know. God never visited me and said, yeah, I want you to prosper. But if I read the Bible... I understand God wants every one of his children to prosper. Can I hear an amen? Yes. Turn to your neighbor and tell him or tell her, God wants you to prosper. Amen. God wants you to prosper. Prosperity, is also, prosperity also means to have in abundance. No lack. See, this is the will of God. This is the heart of God. This is how God thinks. As I mentioned in the morning, after all, everything was created on the earth. The last thing that God did was create man. But by the time man was created and placed on the earth, everything that he would ever need was already provided. Your provision is on the heart of God. I said, God knows what you need. He's, he said, before you ask him, he knows. He's aware of your need. Then if he's aware of my need, why is he not providing? No, 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 don't ask that question. The question is this, why are you not able to tap into what has already been provided? It's not that God is holding it back from, He has already released it. Now, if you remember something that I said, everything that God has provided for is in the realm of the Spirit. Let me give you an example. For example, you see this, um, let's say that wooden stool there. Can you see the wooden stool there? God provided that. But somebody had to look, he looked at the tree and he said, that's a tree. Another man stood at the same, looked at the same tree, said, I can see a chair in it. Another man looked at it and said, I can see a table in it. See, it's perception. They looked at a huge stone. Michelangelo said, that's not a huge stone. I see David in it. Is that true? Yes. Come on. See, the word of God will give you that perception. That illumination that where, where others cannot see, you can see. What others are not able to comprehend, you will comprehend. But that comes as you're illuminated in your mind. As your soul prospereth, so shall you prosper. It has to do with perspective. It has to do how you think. Most people are poor because they think poverty. Most people are poor because they always think lack. 
You're bound by your thoughts. You're liberated by your thoughts. What are, what are thoughts? Thoughts are things, become things. But before a thought can become a thing, the thought is an image. See, when you're diagnosed with a sickness and you go to the doctor and the doctor gives some prescription, he says, this is what's going to happen. Immediately you see a picture in your mind. That's a thought. And so that thought, if it's a, if it's a thought that generates fear, you begin to live in fear, although it has not yet manifested. Is that true? Why? Because the thought has become a picture. It's an, ima it's an image. It's an imagination. It's in the realm of imagination. Now that takes you and the more you think about it, the more you believe it whether it's faith or fear. And because you believe that, remember what Jesus said, be it unto you according to your faith. You empower that to manifest through your faith. Hello? I want you to know God intends for every one of you to be blessed. I want you to know God intends for you to be blessed to the point where you are a blessing to others. You're not excited. I'm the only guy excited in this house. <laughs> Good. Praise God. Thank you so much. Come on. I want every one of you to be excited because the word of God is going to, you know, is going to set you on another level altogether. He's going to pick you up from where you are and transport you into a place of where you enjoy the blessing and the abundance of God. God has provided. So watch what I said. Everything is in the realm of the spirit. Whatever, your money, your car, your house, your land for the church, the resources for building a larger church and impactful ministry, everything God has released. And we are waiting for him to throw it into our lap. No, it doesn't work that way. Now God intends for us to take the element of faith and tap into that realm and translate it from there and bring it into this realm. Hallelujah. It's a partnership, God and man partnership but what we want to do is pray and sit and do nothing about it and we think the entire responsibility is on God no you play a vital role in manifesting God's love his power his wealth his prosperity in your life say amen, amen. Psalm 35 verse 27 can you display that for me over here Psalm 35 verse 27 please thank you Jesus let them shout for joy and be glad who favor my, the righteous cause and let them say continually, let the Lord be magnified who had pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. This is a very important scripture for me. Why? Because in the early days of our married life, as I said in the morning, we went through some very, very challenging times financially. Very small salaries. We lived in the outhouse of a wealthy people's house. It was more like a servant's quarters. We rented that. We had a one room at the bottom and a spiral staircase to go to the bedroom. In the bedroom, we had a mattress on the floor and my wife was pregnant with Steve. And so it was very challenging and we hardly had anything to eat. It was so bad that you know how when women are pregnant, they have cravings and she had a craving for a particular kind of chocolate biscuit. I still remember the name, Bourbon, right? <laughs> She, she was craving for it. Honestly, I had no money to buy that. I still feel bad for, about, about that, but I had no money. We were struggling financially. And there was a day, there was nothing in the house but rice. What do you eat? How do you eat? I was alone. I sat, and I, I can see the picture. Where I sat, I remember. There was a shelf with some books on it. There was one book by Brother Copeland. It was full of promises of God. A, it's a small booklet. I sat on the chair, staring into that shelf, picked it up and started thumbing through the book. And I was reading the scriptures and my eyes fell on this scripture and something grabbed me. I said, that's what grabbed me. Give me that, please. Who has pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. God is pleased when his servants prosper. That became a revelation for me. And I said to the Lord, Lord, that means you're not pleased because I'm not prospering. And your desire. Now, I, I said, what I'm going through is not pleasing God. God, it's not God who is doing this to me. God actually wants me to prosper. 
God actually wants me to be blessed. It's not God who's keeping me in poverty. There's something else that's happening. It's a lack of understanding, lack of knowledge, lack of whatever. I mean, and, and I've been bound in this way of thinking that is causing this to happen. But both of us made up our minds. That few things that we decided right in the very beginning of our married life. Few things. Number one, we said we'll never tell people what our problem is. And for a pastor, it's very, very tempting to let people know what their problems are financially. And, they, and we know how to clothe it so it doesn't appear like we're asking for it. You know what I'm talking about, pastors? <laughs> and we, get, we are very, you know, because we know the right words to use and to not really beg, but really beg. <laughs> you know, like when I was a kid, I remember this. There was these uh, different people who would come home with a Bible in their hands. They'd come from a particular denomination. And uh, they would come home visit. And they're not from our church or our denomination, but they were people who believed in God. And they would go to homes and pray. So they would come home and uh, they would say, we're going to pray for you. And we would stand around. They would pray. And then uh, after the prayer, they would keep their Bibles open and say, we live by faith, you know. And, I, and I'm a kid now, okay? And I'm watching all this. And my mother or my father go inside, they bring some cash, and they put it in the Bible, they close the Bible and walk out. I had an aversion for ministry because of that. I did not want to ever get into ministry. That was the last thing on my mind. And so they were giving the impression, and I'm not criticizing anybody, please, please don't misunderstand me. I'm saying we should have the right heart. We should have the right understanding. We are not at the mercy of the wealthy people. We're not at the mercy of man. We are at the mercy of our God. Hallelujah. And for God, He is no respecter of persons. He only respects faith. Say amen. He respects faith, not man. Hallelujah. He does not respect the color of your skin. He does not respect your nationality. He does not respect your education. He only respects faith. Hallelujah. And that night, we had to go uh, visit somebody and go and pray for them. And we prayed and we were coming away. It was 10 o'clock at night and uh, we had nothing. We didn't know what we were going to eat tomorrow. Suddenly from a neighboring house somewhere, they started shouting at us and saying, please come, please come. And they don't even go to our church. So they called us and we went in and we prayed for them. And we were walking out. Uh, I think it was a birthday, somebody's birthday. They said, please, Pastor, please pray for us. We were walking out. They put an envelope in our hands. We never told them what our need was. We didn't know what was given to us. We come home and we open the envelope. There's just enough for the next day. Hallelujah. See, God is teaching us and taking us step by step. And from there on, God began to give us understanding. And it went on this way, but God really blessed us. Now, what are some of the things we decided to do? Number one, we said we'll never stop tithing ever. No no situation. Now, you know, in those days, it was all cash. We did not have all these systems we have now. So the salary would come in cash form. We'd put the cash on the table and we would lay hands and pray. And the first thing we would do is take the tithe out of it. We used to have boxes in those days, okay? Take the tithe, put it in the box. Then we would have offering for the month, four, four Sundays or five Sundays. We'd take a specific amount and put that in another box. Then we said missions. This is with the very little we had, okay? And we put some for missions. Then we would say for widows and orphans. We put that into the box. Now after all that was done, whatever was left is, uh, is what we use. We, we lived on, that's all. So we cut ourselves down to the size of what we were blessed. But while we were doing it, we were not limiting God. We were thanking God for all our supplies. Hallelujah. Now, God leads you and tests your faith as you move forward. So as this was going on, and we were not, not too bad, uh, you know, uh, we were not living a really blessed life, but all our needs were being met. Sometimes there was a struggle. And we had also a box for daily expenses. Now, for, you have to understand this. When we put those amounts into different boxes, we had made, a, made up our mind, we will not touch what is in one box for the expense of another issue. All right, Because if I did that, that's mismanagement. That's the understanding God gave us. So we said, if somebody came and said, I had money, right, in all these boxes. 
If somebody came and said, look, we're in dire need and um, we need some help. We need you to, you know, we need, can you please, you know, give us some money or can we borrow some? I said, sorry, I don't have any money. Am I lying? I'm not lying. Why? Because I am responsible to do things as a husband. I'm responsible as a father to provide for my child. I'm responsible to take care of the rent. I'm now, if I take money from the rent or the daily supplies and deprive my family or deprive others from what I committed and give it to this person, I'm mismanaging my funds. Are you understanding what I'm saying? And this is what happens in large corporations too. If you don't have the principles laid down, it can affect your church, it can affect wherever you're working, and if you're in the position where you, can, you handle monies you, and you know how to distribute money for things, and when there's a need, you take from here and you spend it there, that is wrong. And that's how people get into trouble. That's why they get into trouble. Now, if, if somebody comes and says, can I borrow some money? Yes, you can lend them if you have disposable income. Are you with me? Maybe you don't agree with me, but I don't care because this is how I live. Okay, I'm just letting you know what I'm doing. And uh, so, and we've been, and that's, that's the journey we're on, okay? Now, it was in 2000, now, right from the very beginning, I was very much influenced by Brother Hagen's materials. I never went to his conferences, but his books really impacted my life that I began to grow in faith and apply faith for healing. I also had the faith for the blessing, but I really did not catch on to that until 2000, the year 2000. We moved to Chicago to spend, you know, live, we lived there for about three to four years. And during that time, we went to Brother, sorry, Pastor Winston's church. When I went to Pastor Winston's church, he began to share about how the Lord led him, his wife, and his son, a little son, to Chicago with just $200 and no place to stay. And God wanted them to start a ministry. <clears throat> he said when they came there, they had no place to stay. There was another, a widow who said, please come home and you can stay with me as long as you need to. So the home opened up. And so he began to live there and began to build the work of the Lord. And by the time we had gone there, they had 33 acres of land, a huge church building, and many uh, tenants on their property like Walmart, and I think there's Taco Bell, and there's another huge uh, chain which you would not know. But all these are renting places from there. 33 acres from 20 minutes from downtown. And he said, all this is by faith. It blew my mind. He came with $200 and he says, today we have all these, we have certain companies and we also have aircrafts. And he said, all this is by faith. I said, Lord, what, what kind of Bible am I reading now? <laughs> what Bible is he reading and what Bible am I reading? Where is it that, how is it that he's enjoying all this, reading the same book? So I made up my mind and I said, Lord, this is what we need in our nation. Because at that time, even at that time, there were a lot of independent ministries and even denominations that were depending on funding that was coming from outside. And I'm not saying anything positive or negative about that, but that created a culture in our country where we stopped looking to God for our provision and began to look to nations and people and organizations to provide for us. Now, I know God can use them, but when we make them our source, then there's a problem. Because tomorrow, if the funding stops, will your ministry stop? What if, what if something happens and they're not able to provide? What if the governments, now we know what we're going through in this nation. They're trying to shut down all that funding, right? Now, what's going to happen to your ministry? If your ministry is depending only on funding that comes from outside and not on God, you're going to shut it down. So it's time for us to understand how does this thing work? Because my Bible tells me that even in the days of famine, you shall flourish. My Bible tells me that God can turn the wilderness into a garden of Eden. 
Come on. It can become a forest. The power to turn things around is not in the ability of the government. It's in the ability of God. But how do I connect to that? How do I tap into that? How do I manifest this? That's why we need the word that gives us the faith to believe for God's prosperity to manifest in our lives. Somebody say amen. amen. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. So I want you to know prosperity from the, the word in, in Psalm 35, 27, that word prosperity is the word shalom. Shalom means nothing missing, nothing broken, nothing wanting, and nothing needed. I'm going to repeat that if you're taking notes. Nothing missing, nothing broken, nothing wanted, nothing needed. That means everything is supplied. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. So if I want to go into and experience the prosperity that God has for me, how do I tap in? I can't teach you everything tonight, but I'm going to attempt to, to take you in, on a journey, all right? Now, let me say this. Prosperity, and this is, this is going to surprise many of you. Prosperity does not answer to prayer. Stop. I want you to let that sink in your minds, in our heart. Because people are praying for prosperity. People are praying for increase in the finances. People are praying for their wealth to increase. It's not happening. Because prosperity does not answer to prayer. So what does it answer to? Prosperity answers to the covenant. Prosperity is a covenant issue. I want, to, I want you to look at that. Get a grasp of this, okay? Because it's not how much you have today. It's not how much you don't have today. If you, are, if you become covenant conscious, no matter where you are, you can start growing and climbing from there. Turn with me to the book of Isaiah chapter 51, please. And give me verse 2 and 3, please. Uh, and can you change the background on that so that the words are clear? Like the black and white or something like that, so words are really clear for me to read. Uh, if not, it's okay. Let, we can continue to do that. Isaiah 51 verse 2, okay? Okay, listen to me, you who follow after righteousness. You who seek the Lord, look to the rock from which you were hewn and to the hole of the pit from which you were dug. Okay, verse 2. Look to Abraham your father. This is what God is saying to us, okay? Look to Abraham your father and to Sarah who bore you, for I called him alone and blessed him and increased him. Stop. God blessed him and God increased him. Not the nations around, not his country from where he came from, but no matter where he was, he was con constantly increasing, although he was going through different terrains, different nations, experiencing famine, and all through that period, he kept increasing. Can I hear an amen? amen. So no matter what is happening around you, nothing should stop your prosperity. Nothing should stop your increase. Nothing should stop your blessing. And that can only happen when the invisible hand of God is upon you. So what you're looking for is not wealth. What you're looking for is not money. What you're looking for is not connections. What you're looking for is not influence. You're looking for God. I said you're looking for God. Genesis chapter 39 verse 2 says, The Lord was with Joseph and Joseph was a... Come on, everybody say prosperous. prosperous. Say prosperous man. Prosperous. Joseph was a what? Prosperous. Everybody shout loudly. Prosperous. Prosper Hang on. Let's understand prosperity. When that scripture is given to us, and it says Joseph was a prosperous man, Joseph was still a slave. Joseph did not have anything to his name because slaves could not have anything to their name. Joseph may not have had even a bank account because he was owned as a piece of furniture by Potiphar. He was at the mercy of Potiphar. And yet the Bible calls him a prosperous man. You have to understand what real prosperity is. The source of prosperity is God. So God is the only source of our blessing. Not man, not the government, 
not your connections, not your in-laws, not your parents. No, God. He can use any and all of them as his tools to prosper you. Come on. But they're not my source. So I don't look to them. I look to God. Hallelujah. Now the Bible says, Potiphar saw this and he took his, all his accounts, his checkbooks, his properties, documents, and he said, Joseph, come here. From today, I don't want to know anything about my future, about my financial future. I don't want to know where to invest. I don't want to know where to plant. I don't, know, I don't want to know what crop you have to plant. It's all yours. Now, wait a minute. This guy is a slave. And in those days, Jews were looked down as untouchables by the, by the Egyptians. Can you see this? See, many times we think, well, I'm a minority. We try to take advantage from the governments claiming to be minority. I, I don't know how it works over here because most of this is described as uh, different ways, northeast, I don't understand. But where I come from, there are a lot of people who say, in church, my name is John. In the office where they work, in the government, their name is Aparal. <laughs> They're hiding their identity because they say, if my boss knows I'm a Christian, they will stop the promotion. So who are they looking to? Not to God, but to man. They don't want to glorify God through, their, through the position God has given them. They say, I'm a Christian, but I want all the benefits that Dalits get. Hang on. Hang on. Are you a child of God? Are you the deprived one? Is God incapable of blessing you? Is God not able to provide you the best? Why do you have to sell your soul for a morsel of bread? If you truly believe God is your source, you will be bold to say, I'm a child of God. Even though you may take all those benefits away from me, I don't care because you're not my source. God will bring all that to me some other way. Come on, you have to know this. Hallelujah. And Potiphar saw how God was blessing everything that he put into Joseph's hands. Now question, how did Potiphar know that Joseph was a man who brought prosperity to him? Did he see a halo over his head? Did he go around with a Bible under his arm? Did he wear a special kind of clothing that says, I'm clergy? No. The results are the proof. People should ask you, how is it that you're blessed so much? How is it? I mean, we, we don't understand how you're getting blessed. But you are getting blessed. They can't deny that you're getting blessed, but they're intrigued and they wonder, how is this happening? They should come and ask you, what is the secret for this blessing? True prosperity is not having a lot of wealth. True prosperity is not having riches. True prosperity is having influence. Potiphar was a slave. Sorry, Joseph was a slave. Potiphar was his master. But the master did what the slave told him. Joseph was a slave. The prison guard was of, over him. But the prison guard permitted Joseph to do whatever he wanted because of the influence he had over him. Come on, you got to get this. Influence in the realm of the spirit attracts these blessings. So the Bible says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. All these things shall be added. That means all... And I think Bishop Oedipo said, all the things that people are dying for shall be added to you. <laughs> all the things that people are dying for shall be added. You are not working for them. 
they are working for you. You know, I tell people, we should not be running after money. Money should be running after you. I tell people, listen, and this is not to boast about who we are. When you get the understanding, you become bold to speak like this. Because of the revelation of the word and knowing the power in the word of God. So I declare wherever I go, I and poverty are divorced for life. I am divorced from poverty. Poverty, I will never be poor. Based on what? Is it because of the wealth I have in the bank or whatever? No. Based on who God is. Based on my relationship with him. He will not permit poverty to come close to me. Because of the understanding I have. That's why the word is so important. Your faith has to be established on what is written. Hallelujah. It is written that God desires you prosper. Watch what he said. I called Abraham. I blessed Abraham. I increased Abraham. It's my responsibility. God takes responsibility to prosper you and I. If you're excited, shout hallelujah. It's not that you have to strive to become prosperous. Your striving is not for becoming prosperous. You strive to, to grow in your intimacy with God and grow in your understanding of his word. I labor in prayer, not labor to get money. I labor in the word, not labor to make riches. When I labor in the word, I labor in prayer, I labor to build the kingdom of God, God causes the resources to come to me. They're attracted. I even say this, I'm a money magnet. I mean, some people get very angry about this. Uh, they think you're arrogant. I'm not being arrogant. I have so many experiences where people I do not know have come to me and said, Pastor, God told us, or we are led by the Spirit, or we are so touched by whatever, and we have come to sow this into your life. Because we see that when we do this, we get blessed. We went to a town sometime back, and uh, we were doing three days of meetings. And uh, I was in a hotel, and, and these guys come to me and said, uh, Sir, there's a pastor, a senior, pa senior pastor, a very senior man in town. He wants to come and see you. I never met the man. I never knew him. And uh, he's, I said, oh, sure. I mean, he, he's a man of God. I want to respect him. I, so he can come over. So he comes over and he says, Pastor, I've been listening to you. And I'm really blessed. You know, you're talking about the sowing of the seed and how God prospers. How, I'm so blessed. He said, listen, I have come to sow this into your life. I understand the value of this. I want to sow this into your life and leave. Just, he was there for five minutes, that's all. He, all he did was he came to give, give that and walk away. He came to sow the seed. I did not ever know him. I never told anybody that I have need. I did not have any needs. Hallelujah. And that's not one. Several times it has happened. I remember another instance. There was a guy in the church who said, soon after service, he said, Pastor, you know what? I need to see you for a few minutes. Can I come home? I said, sorry, I don't let anybody come home. I need my rest. And I don't want, I want my privacy. So I said, listen, uh, I, I, I can't. He said, no, no, pastor, please, just for two minutes. Give me just two minutes. I said, okay, two minutes is two minutes. He said, all right, pastor, I'm coming. So he said, as soon as I went back, I changed, and he was right at the door. So I walked him into the office and said, what do you want? I thought he was asking for prayer. He, no, he said, no, sir. He pulled out a checkbook, and he started writing. And, he started, and I started counting the zeros. And you know what he did? He said, sir, I just came to obey God. God told me to sow this into your life. And he walked away. I'm telling you this to let you know God is our source. We don't have to tell people what your needs are. He, he's the one that should know what your need is. He's the one that you should look to. He's your provider. He's your source. He will be the one that will bless you. I called Abraham. I blessed Abraham. I increased Abraham. Are you a seed of Abraham? Yes. Are you a child of Abraham? Yes. Are you a son of Abraham? What makes you think God will not do the same for you? 
Don't believe the world. Don't believe your experiences. Don't believe what people are saying. Don't believe the lies of the devil. You live in India, a third world country. You live in a remote place. You're so far away, at least two hours away from the nearest airport. How do you think any prosperity will ever manifest in your life? Shut up, devil. Shut up, devil. My God is not limited by airplanes. My God is not limited by where I live. I can live on the top of the hill or down in the valley. My God is not limited by geography. Prosperity is not geographical. Your prosperity is not located in the nation. Your prosperity is located in Christ. So wherever you live, whether in the boondogs or you are in the richest and the wealthiest city in the world, God is your source. Let that be established in our heart. God is my source. Only God. What are we talking about? We're talking about the covenant. So he said to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. My time is up. I've just started the introduction. I mean, I'm not, I mean, it's okay because I'm going to take you further tomorrow again, okay? My desire is not just to get you excited. My desire is to plant something in your heart. When you teach on these subjects, you may not experience, he, you, you know, I'm, don't limit God. You, while you're listening to me about prosperity, your bodies are being healed. Revelation is coming. Don't limit God. I said, don't limit God. Hallelujah. Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. Now the Lord had said to Abraham, get out of the country, from your family, from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse him who curses you. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now go back to verse 2 please. Okay. I will make you a great nation. Who? Lord. Say Lord. The Lord. Okay. Lord. God. Okay. God is promising Abraham. I will make you a great nation. I will be, I will bless you and I'll make your name great. Paraphrase version. I will make you rich, famous and distinguished. That's what God is saying. Paraphrase version. I'll make you rich, famous and distinguished. How many are trying to become famous by trying to get more and more likes on Facebook? How many are trying to become famous by posting stuff on Instagram. There's a desire for in everyone's heart to become famous. It's innate in people. But we are striving in our own strength. Let's not do that. Everyone has a destiny in God and everyone is a champion in God. If you will surrender to the Lord and do what he tells you to do. He said, okay, I will do all this, but it's conditional. You have to dislocate. And move away from your environment. Because in your environment, there is pagan culture. Your environment is a heathen culture. It's idol worship. There is a way of thinking that has molded you to be who you are. If you have to move into your next level of blessing, number one, you must be born again. Number two, renew your mind. The mind is renewed to the word of God. Now, if you're living in an environment and you want to move to the next level, you have to first deal with the environment that is toxic or negative and keeping you locked in that place. Let me say something. Many of you who have come to this church have come from different denominations. And I'm sure you came from denominations where they don't give the emphasis on the Holy Spirit the baptism of the Holy Spirit, or speaking in tongues. Does that make sense? Am I telling you the truth? You came into this church, you heard the word, you believed, and you received the Holy Spirit, and you started speaking in tongues. Has that happened to anyone? I said, has it happened to anyone? What happened? You moved out of your country, out of that environment, out of that culture, if you want to become prosperous, you cannot be located in the place of poverty. Get out of the poverty mentality environment. 
even if it's your own family members. If your church does not speak and is always speaking against prosperity, get out of that place if you want to experience the prosperity of God promises. So God said, I will make you rich. I'll make you famous. I'll make you distinguished. But you have to do something. Get out from that environment that is limiting you. Many of us are praying, are reading the Bible, but are not experiencing the blessing of God. Because what is hindering us, what is blocking our progress, and what is keeping us bound is the culture we live in. The environment that we live in. The words we constantly hear. It's keeping us, our mentality, to be bound by the spirit of poverty. We have to change the way we think. You have to see. Now, you're at a certain place. How am I thinking? How do poor people think? And how do rich people think? Somebody said, when you walk into a house, into a poor man's house, you'll see the largest TV that they could, have, they could buy on loan. You walk into a rich man's house, you'll find a huge library. Come on. <laughs> Slowly it's getting on to you. Before prosperity can manifest, mentality has to change. God had to dislocate Abraham and bring him out of his environment, exclude him from everything that's been influencing his life, and now begin to work on him. So he journeys. As he's journeying, everywhere he goes, number one, he establishes an altar and he begins to worship God. Is that true? So what's he doing? He's growing in his fellowship with God. And he's able to hear his voice and God is influencing his thinking. He's constantly being reminded, I've called you to bless you. And my blessing is not limited to you, Abraham. It's that you could be blessed to be a blessing to the nations. Hallelujah. God wants you. Who? You that does not have a job today. You who think you have nothing left. You who think there's nothing in your wallet. Who you, who you think that does not have the, the money for the next meal. God is looking at you and saying, I want you to be a blessing to the nations. You're saying, me? I don't even have enough money for my next meal, Lord. I, I don't even have money to get back home. I'm actually using the transport, the public transport, and somebody's paying for me. I'm talking to you. God wants you to be a blesser of the nations. And God can make it happen if only you can believe. Because he said, to him that believeth, all things are possible. It's not by crying. It's not by begging. It's by expanding your thinking through the word of God. Changing your mindset, changing your mentality, seeing yourself in a place where by the grace of God, by the enlightenment that comes from the Holy Spirit, seeing yourself in a place where you are a blessing to others. Amen. Come on. Amen. 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 See, and, and he says this, is making a promise to Abraham. In chapter 15, we don't have time tonight to look at that. You see how God cuts a covenant with him. He tells them how to bring the offering, cut them into half, lay them opposite each other, and then he falls into sleep, and then the torch goes, the, the, the fire of God goes through it. And it's that's when the, the covenant is established. Now, we'll close with this for tonight. In chapter 17, verse, um, chapter 17, verse 1 and 2, and verse 6, please. Chapter 17. Genesis chapter 17, by the way. Now the Lord had said to Abram, get out of, no, 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 17. When Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am almighty God, walk before me and be blameless. Go on. And I will make my what? Say it louder. I will make my covenant between me and you and will multiply you exceedingly. Hallelujah. Multiplication is a result of the covenant, not your effort. Because in natural terms, he had no more strength to have children. 
nor did his wife have any strength to have children, to multiply. He said, I'm making a covenant with you that I will multiply you. Go on. Uh, no, verse 6. I will make you exceeding fruitful and I will make nations of you and kings shall come from you. Somebody shout hallelujah. I said shout hallelujah. Your seed that God will bless you with a royalty. You're saying, but I'm living in a rented house. It's a shack. I know. I know. I've been there. But my children are not going to be there. Because my faith is going to grow as I spend time in His presence. And the children that are going to be born out of my loins will have the mentality of a royal person. Royalty. Kings will come forth. Kings are people who have dominion. Kings are people who know how to rule and reign over their circumstances. Kings are not moved by people and not moved by circumstances. They take dominion over that. God wants to give us children that will know how to walk in dominion in this world. Somebody say amen. amen. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Amen. <sighs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> what, what is a covenant? A covenant is an agreement that is established. The, it's the highest form of agreement established between two or more parties. The highest form of agreement. And when it is sealed in blood, it can never be annulled. The only way out of a covenant, a blood covenant, is death. You listening to me? A blood covenant cannot be broken. Now do you understand why God says, I hate divorce? Because marriage is a blood covenant. And according to primitive cultures and according to the word as well, when somebody enters into a covenant, a blood covenant, and they want to get out of it, the only way was death what if that was established today for every marriage there would hardly be any divorces if you really understood what covenant means see when we don't teach the value of covenant people think of divorce as an option divorce is not an option for a child of God because in the presence of God and in the presence of people we have made and cut a covenant and it's a blood covenant. Say amen. amen. Hallelujah. So, do you understand now how serious God is about prosperity? Because he made a covenant with Abraham and I'm the seed of Abraham. Amen. Every promise that God made to Abraham is mine through Christ Jesus. Amen. That's what Galatians chapter 3 verse 29 says, right? Every promise that God made to Abraham is mine through Christ Jesus. So how dare you live in poverty? How dare you live in lack? How dare you suffer and struggle financially? You are not supposed to. You have to rebel against it. No, this is not my position. This is not my address. This is not where God wants me to live. God wants me to be in a place where I can be a blessing to the nations. Come on. Thank God for your business you have, small, medium, large, whatever it is. Thank God for your education. Thank God for your status. Thank God for your job. Thank God for all that. But they can never make you a blessing to the degree that you can be a blessing to others. Only God can get you to that place where abundance is where you live. You're not in lack. See, because that's the heart of God. When he said, cast your net in the deep, how much did he catch? Not just a handful. God provided for him and his neighbors. And also so much that the boats began to sink and then this began to break. God is a God of abundance. Somebody say, God is a God of abundance. Say it again. Say it again. Say it again. Say it again. God is a God of abundance. And he wants you to have the abundance in every area of your life. 
abundance of joy, abundance of peace, abundance of tranquility, abundance of joy in your marriage, abundance in the way your family lives, abundance in, in every area, hallelujah, including finances. Not exclusively finances, but including finances. Abundance. Everywhere in the Bible you see abundance. How many people needed to eat? 5,000 men. Besides all the women, maybe another 5,000. Maybe another 3,000 kids. Maybe about 15,000, 20,000, whatever the number. He started giving them, food, distributing the food. After, the Bible says, they, and they all were full. They ate to the full. They didn't just ration it out. They didn't just say, just eat a little bit until you get home. He gave them more than enough to eat and then said, collect the fragments. And people start teaching. People, God will meet your needs but not your wants. Which Bible are you reading? Because he says in the book of Psalms, he will fulfill my desires. If I delight myself in him, he will fulfill my desires. Desires are not needs. Desires are wants. Talk to me somebody. It's a talk to me somebody. Desires are not needs. God does not just meet your need. He had to feed another 4,000. Again, there were baskets full left over. He started providing for the widow in Zarephath. He, her, she, her son, and the prophet. And it kept coming over and over every night, every morning, every morning there was fresh supply until the rain showed up. God is not limited in his resources. There is no poverty. There is no lack in heaven. There is no lack in the kingdom of God. There is abundance in the kingdom of God. There's overflow in the kingdom of God. Now listen to me. We have to go to work, not begging, pleading, harassing God. We have to go to work on ourselves. Sit with that word. Listen to this kind of teaching that will encourage you, build you, and give you a different understanding. Your mentality begins to change. As you sit under the influence of such teaching, it begins to expand your thinking and make you realize what is the heart of God toward me. And what I'm really experiencing is not God. God is not the source of this supply, of this shock supply. God is not the source of this evil. Or God is not the source of this lack. No, there's something else and I can get out of it. As the word comes, light comes. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Let's understand prosperity is a covenant issue.